Good. Are you in London right now? No, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, I mean, I'm leaving quarantine. I'm sorry, I'm last day of quarantine en route to Lake Baikal in Siberia. Oh, wow, okay. So I'm actually in Moscow. Right. Very good. Uh, panelists, we're live already. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you are. Uh, I'm Vikram Panna, I'm the Associate Editor of the Space Science in Singapore. And it's my pleasure to moderate this plenary on the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the SDGs, uh, as you would know, are a blueprint, perhaps the most comprehensive blueprint that exists for the betterment of humanity. It sets goals related to poverty, health, inequality, gender disparities, climate, employment, and other issues. And what we're going to do is we're going to discuss whether these goals are as relevant and important as ever in the wake of COVID-19 and what we might, what it might take for us to achieve them. Um, we have a, a very distinguished and very diverse panel of four speakers. Um, uh, from, from the bottom right, uh, if I may start, there's uh, Nadia Swarovski, who is the chair of the Swarovski Foundation, uh, going clockwise to uh, our, our <coughs> Lord Barker, who is the executive chairman of EN Plus, an energy company uh, based, based in, he's currently in Moscow. Uh, he was formerly Britain's Minister of State for Energy and Climate Change. Um, after him is Dato uh, Binod Sekhar, who is Chairman and CEO of the Petra Group in Malaysia. And on, on, on my right is Professor uh, Borja Santos Boras of IE University in Spain. Uh, welcome fellow panelists. Uh, if I may start with just asking you to introduce yourselves briefly, yourselves and your organizations, and how, if at all, uh, they are connected or you are connected to work related to the SDGs. Can we start with you, Nadia? Yes, thank you. First of all, it's a wonderful honor to be here. Thank you so much for including me. Um, I am the chair of the Swarovski Foundation, which was started in 2013. The foundation is a UK uh, charity. We have focused, or we're focused on, on three different areas, one being human empowerment, another one being equality, and uh, the third pillar is environment. Um, the foundation was really set up in parallel to the organization and to its initiatives within sustainability, but predom predominantly it is based on the founding fathers' principles, in particular in terms of philanthropy. Uh, the founding father was Daniel Swarovski, my great-great-grandfather who founded the company 126 years ago. Over the years, Swarovski has been collaborating with the UN Global Compact, the UN Women Empowerment Program, and subsequently in 2016, when the principles were launched, um, the foundation in particular really embraced the 17 different goals as an anchor to the initiatives of the organization. Thank you. Uh, Lord Barker? Yes, hello. I'm uh, Greg Barker. I'm uh, executive chairman of the N Plus Group. We are the world's largest producer of low carbon aluminium, uh, uh, the biggest producer of aluminium per se outside of China uh, globally. Uh, we're also a, a clean energy company with the world's largest producer of hydropower in the private sector. Um, we generate about 17 gigawatts of uh, electricity from our hydropower plant. To put that in some sort of context, the Hoover Dam uh, in the US, which you might be familiar with, that produces two gigawatts of uh, electricity, and we in total produce about 16 from our, from our, from our installations. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a big group. We employ about 100,000 people um, globally in about 12 countries uh, worldwide. Having a very long supply chain from mining in Africa and the West Indies to uh, refining and smelting in Europe to um, generating power uh, and our major smelting plants in, uh, in Siberia. Um, we have a truly global supply chain, but we have a global footprint impact as well. Um, we There's a long tradition with the group in terms of uh, playing a, a role as a res responsible corporation um, 
and employer. So it was a logical step for us when we became a public company and, and engaged more internationally to uh, join the UN Global Compact. And we're very pleased to be part of that. Um, and we have a focus on, a, um, obviously, um, we, we try and aspire to all of the SDGs, but we have a particular focus on certain of them, uh, clean energy being at the centre, but uh, perhaps mm -hmm. I can come back to that a little later. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, Dr. Vinod? Oh, I'm Vinod Shekha. Um, I'm the chairman and CEO of the Petra Group. Um, and as part of the group, we have our foundation, uh, the Shekha Foundation, as well as uh, the Institute, the Shekha Institute. And uh, we're a diversified conglomerate of essentially innovative technology based companies. Uh, we have the world's only true recycling process for waste rubber, for green rubber, uh, which is the world's number one environmental hazard at the moment. We have one of the world's largest natural vanilla production companies producing natural vanilla. Uh, we are in modular homes. We have the largest modular building technology companies uh, outside China. Um, and we've gone into different areas like film production uh, in Asia, TV production. We have our own OTT platform. Uh, we've invested heavily um, in different parts of the world in in media uh, to get the message across, um, and, and 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 you know everything from monorail systems and engineering uh, in different parts of our companies. Um, our foundation focuses on essentially community development and children specifically uh, to enhance communities and children. Uh, that looks at. Um, uh, mothers as well as, as families, because that's a critical element in allowing children to grow. So we've looked at different aspects of that. Our institute focuses on social capitalism, which is what our group is based on. It's what I believe in. That is the idea is that you can make as much money as you want, but if you don't play a role in setting up your community, your environment, your the place that you make money out of, um, you, you cannibalize your own market and everything in place. So I want more money, so I need more people to rise to the middle class, so I need to play a role in eradicating poverty. Why? Simply because I want their money. I need them to have it before I can take it. So it's a selfish thing, but I believe that all business not a play role in lifting people out of poverty. Um, and that's that's the group, and that's what we focus on. 60% of the entire group is owned by the foundation. Uh, and so while I'm a hardcore capitalist, I'm a hardcore capitalist that money flows to what doing the things that I believe matter for our group uh, in terms of ensuring the group, group grows further uh, financially, materially, and so that we can impact societies more aggressively. What, what an amazing company. Could I, could I just ask one question? Do you make modular homes out of green rubber that smell of vanilla? Ah, well, we, 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 make, we, we use green rubber in our modular homes, but that's a good idea. I might ask them to see whether they can take some of them with vanilla and use it to enhance the smell of the, of the modular homes. <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah, me right. Very good. Uh, Borja. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Brickham. Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm working at IE University. IE is an international university based in Madrid, Spain. Um, and we have students from all over the world, uh, more than 100 nationalities in the campus. And obviously, I mean, our main SDGs, I would say, is ensure quality education. But all the SDGs somehow are transversally integrated in our curriculums. I mean, since two years, for example, we have redesigned many of our programs in economics or international relations. So in the study plans, the students study a lot of content that is in the Agenda 2030, uh, that is part of the SDGs. And as well, we try to teach them the skills needed to achieve this agenda. And it's a pleasure to me uh, to be here because I've been working for, before uh, working at the university, I've been working for United Nations for more than 10 years in many different countries. So uh, I've been very related to the agenda uh, in an international organization. Thank you. So you're an insider. Excellent. <laughs> okay, so now on to the main event. Um, the SDGs, well, you, uh, I'm sure you've, you, you've known that even before COVID, uh, the world was falling short of meeting SDG targets. Um, but after COVID, there's been even more backsliding. There's more poverty, there's more kids out of school, more inequality, more gender disparities, uh, even climate goals are sort of stretched further away. So the question that arises, and this is, this, this, there's a debate about this right now. The question is, should we accept that the SDGs as formulated are basically unattainable by 2030? Uh, 
uh, but should we revise the targets or even the goals themselves? Um, so there are two schools of thought. One is that, yes, we should be more realistic. We should lower our ambition. Uh, we should do what is within the capacities of governments to achieve. We should maybe prioritize differently. The other school says, no, the SDGs are more relevant than ever. They are a guide path out of the crisis, and they should not be up for revision. So I'd like to ask you all where you stand on this issue of whether the SDGs need to be revised, reprioritized, or anything else, even scrapped, some people suggest. So, Nadia, you go first. Well, I'm definitely part of that uh, second school of thought. I think they should definitely be adhered to. I think, personally, from my experience, that they're not known well enough to the world. And I think the reason why they exist is, um, to me, it seems like it has been a combination of the UN um, Global Compact, the 10 principles, plus the UN Women Empowerment principles, which are seven principles. And again, they were so specific to corporations. And I, I find that the goals are um, have been created to be a little bit more democratic, um, could be better understood um, by the different age, uh, range, age range. Um, and I just really think it's better to have high goals and perhaps not achieve them than low goals and not achieve them. Right. And um, I think a lot of people don't take the they don't realize how pressing the issues are. And I think it's um, very, very crucial that um, customers are educated, employees are educated, students are educated, the general public is educated, the government knows about them, obviously the UN knows about them. So I really am for keeping the goals, but promoting them better and also um, teaching the world how they can reali be realized, how, uh, their vision and their um, concept can be actually implemented. Thank you. That's very eloquently said. Um, Lord Barker, what, where do you stand on the on the issue of whether we should have the goals as they are or what is that? Well, well you're certainly right that um, COVID-19, this whole experience of the last 18 months, has you know, brought a terrible impact on global communities, with many of the poorest being the worst impact of all um, but there's no country that's escaped unscathed and this has not just damaged populations but it's also damaged you know government budget it's damaged um, business but we're now you know, not through covid by any means but we are we are focused on recovery and people are focused on what comes next and while the SDGs may have been set back in the short term by the impact of this terrible pandemic. I think there is something going on right the way around the world, which is a, a reset of the way that people think and approach business, are approaching life, are approaching what's important in the world. And certainly in business, you're seeing a transformation um, among those who, in, who are investing in the way that they view ESG. Um, and you know, goals and ESG metrics, which pre-COVID were perhaps uh, something that many investors and businesses paid lip service to, I think are taking on much more relevance uh, and importance in a post-COVID world. And I think it's incumbent on all of us that really care passionately about these SDG issues to ensure that this isn't just a sort of passing post-COVID phase, but actually it represents a real opportunity, whether you call it a reset or a or a recalibration, to actually really focus on the SDGs. And I think as people come out of COVID, wanting to be more socially responsible, wanting to recalibrate the way that they, they work and the way that they prioritise what's important in their lives, we need some goals, we need some clear metrics to steer by. Mm -hmm. And I think the SDGs are there. They're ready. We don't have to reinvent them. They're more relevant than ever. And I think what we need to do, um, just Nadia said, to make them more widely known and comprehensible. My only slight question would be that there are a lot. Um, I think if I were to reinvent them, I would try, although I'd, it would be quite difficult to choose which one to to um, uh, get rid of. But having quite a menu can sometimes be a challenge. So it does create a slightly uh, 
more of a button to people interested in this issue rather than a, a, you know, a set menu. Um, so I, for us, we have a focus, we'll come back to it. I think no, more than ever, SDGs have a role to play, and I think they, are, they will be critical in helping many people who are new to this agenda find a sensible and worthwhile route map forward. Mm -hmm. Also, I, 193 governments have signed up to them. Amazing. So, I mean, if you want to reinvent them, you'll have to go through that process again. Yeah. Right. Tough ask. You know, how do you feel on this issue of the SDGs and whether they're as important as ever or need to be revised, reprioritized? Sorry, I was muted. Yeah. Um, look, I think it's a great wish list. I think we all need wish lists. We need, we need targets. Um, and I think what Nadja said is absolutely important. The bottom line is we can no longer afford not to pay attention to what these SDGs represent. We're heading for a cliff. We're going to just fall off the cliff. Uh, we know not when. And yet we accelerate. Uh, that's our position right now. The world is accelerating over the cliff. Um, and I'm being a bit selfish. I'd like not to, please. I'd like not to jump off the cliff because I can see that cliff. I can see it's the edge. And I'd like to work out a way in which we can maybe slow down and steer away. Um, and I think the SDGs are a clear, clear program that we can start working on. And I think what we need to understand is we need to deal with human nature. Businesses need to see how they can benefit. And so this is a total realignment, a paradigm shift, if you like, in how we see economics working. Right now, this pandemic, as, as awful as it's been, has given us that opportunity to, to pivot, to actually see, look at the situation and realize <coughs> without working together globally, we're all screwed. I mean, to put it yeah. mildly, and we need to work together. We need to understand, you know, it doesn't matter if something happens in a small country uh, 6,000 miles away. Uh, it can very easily impact you directly, fatally, um, in, in the world we live in. Um, and, you know, if there is a massive uh, natural disaster uh, uh, somewhere in Asia or somewhere in Japan, and that impacts uh, the logistics for the key components for manufacturing in America or Europe, it can destabilize our economic order. We're all interrelated one form or another. And whether it's the environment, whether it's poverty, whether it's education, healthcare, we need to figure out a way of moving forward positively. And businesses need to at least understand and accept that without their involvement, we're not going to move. I said this before, politicians are not enough. Right, and politicians are fluid. They exist for four years or five years. Some of them might be there for ten years, but you know, governments change, and policies change, and political directions change. But businesses, they're there for a long time. For us, foundations for us in business is over a hundred years old. If I'm not, if I'm not right, and, uh, so there are businesses remain. So we need to somehow convince economic leaders that they need to be involved in societal development, that their own, their own economic benefit is related to how our environment operates, how our society grows, and how, how our community can be enriched. And if we can get that, then we can get the... You see, I think CSR is a dirty word. I'm, I'm sorry, I know a lot of people don't, but CSR has allowed people just to tick a box. Oh, look, I, I allow my staff to go once more to go plant a tree. Um, and, you know, great, we've done our bit. That's not enough anymore. We need societal development. We need to be involved at the at the. You know, it needs to be part of the lifeblood of a company. How it operates from leadership all the way down. That in, in, it needs inspirational leadership, so that others follow suit in their own way. Because it doesn't matter. You can't change the world, but you can change one life. You can't change a whole city, but maybe you can change your community. Maybe you can change your neighborhood. Maybe you can deal with the road you live on. So there are many things individuals can do, but that requires inspirational leadership. That requires giving hope. And I think that's where businesses and economic leaders must now not just participate, but lead in. What they've, they've normally sat back and let politicians lead. Now it's time to understand that economic leaders, business leaders have a serious role to play and they can no longer say, no, no, that's my taxes are for. 
uh, it's not that anymore. And I think that's the, that change, that shift that we need today. Thank you. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, Professor, your thoughts on the Thank you. of ambition that we should have, whether we should be fully ambitious as an insider, what do you think? <laughs> well, um, first, <clears throat> I, I agree with my colleagues that, I mean, the agenda gives us the opportunity to tackle uh, global problems, right? Uh, more and more, our national priorities are global issues. We cannot solve climate, we cannot solve ocean problems, we cannot solve economic growth unless our neighbors are solving them as well, right? So we need it, right? And I agree with Nadia that it has taken a lot of time just to create awareness of agenda, <laughs> just to say, no, now we are going to change it, right? Um, second, I mean, the agenda is a global guidance. Every nation, every country doesn't take the 17 goals. Every nation chooses their own priorities and, and they develop them, right? And they decide which one are their targets. But at least every country has a guidance, has a global guidance. Like we need to go in that direction, right? Even though each nation has different priorities. Then third, it might, be, it might be true that we have 169 targets and we know already that many of them is going to be very hard to achieve. So Bikram was saying, like, shall we then revisit them? But the reality is that, I mean, unfortunately, we do not have much data. We don't, we don't have enough data to track the SDGs globally in all the countries. Just to give you some data, for the SDG 5, the gender inequality, only... 40% of the countries, like 4 out of 10, have data available to track gender inequality in their countries. And more than half of the countries in the world, they have poverty data from 2016, like not any more later than that. So how you are going to redesign uh, targets if you do not have updated data, right? It doesn't make sense. So, and finally, imagine you play a cricket game or a basketball game, right? and you doesn't reach half of the time and you are losing by 20. Suddenly, you do not take a time out and say, hey, let's try to change the target of winning. Let's, let's try to lose only by 10. No, you say, no, we need to win, right? We still have 20 more minutes. So I think this is what we need to do with the agenda as well. Thank you. I mean, such an important point that uh, we don't, there's no data on a lot of these things. So even if they're achieved, we wouldn't know. I mean, we wouldn't know how far short we are if we don't have the data. So I guess that should be a priority. Mm -hmm. But this, this leads nicely to the second issue I'd like to raise, which is how do we get from here to there? Uh, I think we know that did make some points on that, but I'd like, like, like some elaboration. So what are the pathways to success? What will it take for us to sort of really get this moving uh, more rapidly? Maybe you can just say talk about three things that need to fall into place for things to move forward uh, faster so nadia what what, what would you mm -hmm. suggest well i have to say um education is number one mm -hmm. and uh certainly the education with the young generation because the young generation you know seems to be a little bit more receptive mm -hmm. to um everything to you know certainly this crisis to the climate um to the um, SDGs to learning something new. I think the older generation often, uh, at least again from what I've witnessed, they are in disbelief. They don't think climate change is real. And um, I think therefore education with the young generation is really, really crucial. Um, so I think the schooling system is fantastic. It's great to hear, Borja, that there are these specific courses. Quite frankly, personally, I believe every university should make it a requirement, or actually even every high school should make um, the knowledge about environment, climate change, and so on, a really a requirement. Um, and then I think companies, um, as you were also saying, um, we you know it's so you know i think leaders have really that accountability if it's a political leader or a business leader they have the accountability or also the wonderful opportunity to put forth the values and the guidelines um in the vision and mission of their organization you know it can influence so many employees the employees in turn influence their own families um as a company you can influence your customers so again corporations are so important to set a new tone and show new principles 
Um, and then the final element certainly is, you know, businesses. I mean, sorry, the government. Governments can really um, have a huge, huge role and impact in making an improvement, you know, in, in increasing the awareness. Right, right. Thank you. Lord Barker, you've been a politician as well. So I think you're very well placed, especially well placed to answer this question. What will it take? Three things that would be you put on top of your list. Apologies, I think you might be muted, sir. Polit politicians aren't going to um, take this as seriously as it deserves unless civil society, you know, the voters, the, um, the public are, are uh, really taking it seriously. So we can't just subcontract this to our governments and expect them to get on with it if everybody's not engaged. It's such a huge agenda. But I think we also have to recognize on such a a broad set of goals that different um, actors will have different uh, agenda. Um, and you know, governments ha have the biggest agendas of all. They have the greatest capacity to embrace all of the development goals, particularly you know, uh, those governments in uh, developed countries with substantial development budgets. So they need to, you know, post-COVID, they need to step up and show leadership. You know, that's what we look to from our politi to politicians. We need inspiring leadership that brings people together um, and are capable of forging an inclusive agenda, not narrow self-interest. And, and as much as people have suffered during COVID, I think that there is, it has spawned a greater sense of community, not just in, in, in people's immediate environment but also of greater sense that we live in a in a connected world and that we all you know we have a shared responsibility so i hope that you know global politicians will step up but then conversely um it, they can't just be left to them um you know business has has to engage as well this year we've got the big you know an opportunity for um i think it's um is it eight or 13 i'm never very good on the sdg numbers but climate this is the year of climate with the cop 26 mm -hmm. um, meeting in glasgow in november this is something that's going to capture the whole world's imagination governments business civil society and i think we've got to grasp that energy and once we hopefully we have a, an outcome at cop 26 that we go on to channel that focus and that community spirit into other sdgs with an equal sense of focus and determination so I, I was just wondering, as, as a politician, since you mentioned this point, do you think you could sell the idea to the to the electorate that you know we need to work together on this, and the, the, you need we need to sort of have, have this agenda, we need to support this agenda? Would you? Yes, is it, it sell yes, but it it won't sell itself. Uh, um, politicians need to invest in this. They need to find a voice that for you know the post COVID times but i do think that there is a if they if they can find that voice that goes beyond you know there's too much shrill nationalism and populism if they can find the words that do cut across that you know that don't just sound um woke if it were if it's were, don't just sound like they're mouthing platitudes but speak in a way that's relevant to their particular constituencies but nevertheless do so in a way that speaks beyond their immediate constituencies um, particularly in developed countries. So I very much hope that this will be right at the top of the agenda of the G7 that's going to be meeting in the UK this week. Uh, and we, you know, there's a glo you know, global leadership comes with global responsibility. Um, and I think if the, if the G7 can um, set um, a real um, example and show serious intent and focus, that will cascade down into business. And I think it will also give a degree of optimism and, uh, and encouragement to other countries outside that group of the richest nations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. So, you know, what would it take? Three things. What would it take? <laughs> yeah. What would it take? <laughs> um, I, I have less... Lord Barker, with all due respect, I, I have so much... I mean, and it's probably because I'm in Malaysia. <laughs> but I have so much less confidence in politicians and governments um, doing what is actually needed because of geopolitics, because of geopolitics and personal pol political agendas and, and, and issues related to that. Um, 
what I think is required is for the most senior business leaders in the world to actually decide that this is something they have to deal with and deal with now. I believe if you have the richest among us, the most influential among us, among economic leaders, and if they actually decide we will do this, I believe the politicians will follow. Um, whether we like it or not, economics and money rules to a, certain, to a, to a significant extent how the world operates, uh, how politics operates uh, in terms of what a country can get and how the economics of a country develops and how um, social development is addressed in a country. So why, why can't we get the most influential, the most powerful business leaders in the world uh, some of the most important hedge funds, some of the most important, uh, I mean, all these people, if you can get them together and say, listen, guys, for our own sakes, we need to do something. Now, first thing, if we can get them on the same page and say, this has to be done now because we're dying, because this world is going off a cliff. We have to deal with it now together all around the world. And, and don't forget, during this pandemic, we've actually produced more billionaires than we did the year before. How ironic is that? I mean, just put things in perspective. There are people losing jobs. There are businesses closing down. But whether we like it or not, and as awful as it is, the rich became richer That's in the world now. So much. Sorry? That's because stock markets have gone up so much, basically. Asset well, prices. Stock markets gone up so much. Product sales in some products have gone up so much. Glove manufacturers have become instant billionaires. Uh, PP. I mean, there's so many reasons for it. It's across the board. But that's not the point. I think the point is there is wealth. And that, with that wealth comes with a huge amount of responsibility and ability. The question is, can we now ensure or force these economic leaders to take that responsibility and use that, that sizable influence to make a difference? And I really believe if you can get them all together, beyond just talking, uh, that, they, that we people like me, we do all the time, but if you can actually get us to do something and decide we can do it, you're going to see some serious change. So I would I would look forward to seeing an engagement of serious business leaders by people like Lord Barker, who has that influence, and others like me and uh, like Nadja and all that that has has access to these people. Uh, and even you, Vikram, you're 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 a, you're a senior editor at the Straight Times. You have access to these people. How do we cajole them? How do we get them to wake up and say, "Look, guys, it's time for you to spend maybe an hour a day of your work life to deal with this." Because that's pretty much what's required. It's not a lot of the time. You're not asking them to sacrifice anything. You're asking them to now actually do something important that's going to change how we operate in this world. And I go back to saying I believe that this pandemic, as awful as it's been, as, as awful as it's been, is giving us an opportunity to pivot there. Like, so, okay, in, in, in summary, you, you're, you basically favor a more private sector-led approach to dealing with these issues. To, to, to solve it. Well, I, I believe that I, I believe I believe governments have a role to play, but I don't believe that it'll work unless the private sector comes and gets fully involved. If it's just the government, it won't lead anywhere. Fair enough, mm -hmm. Professor. Your take. Thank you. Take. Yeah, I mean, if I need to highlight three things, maybe I go first for um, health and safety net programs. Um, I mean. Uh, I mean, all the health systems in most of the countries have been overwhelmed by COVID, right? And unfortunately, there are many other diseases that have been somehow left apart, right? And, and I mean, one of the main goals is to reduce mortality rates in, in different stages, right? Um, not only when, when the kids are very young, um, but also in, in, in aging issues and so on. So I think investment on health will be very important not to overwhelm um, the system as it has been done in the, in the last year. And safety net as well, not only to families, but as well to businesses, um, at least until until there is enough recovery, right? So they, like, it happens in many in many countries worldwide that we, I mean, in Europe, for example, we are getting huge amounts of loans from the European Commission just to keep running our businesses. So, uh, I mean, if they keep running, we do not stop our services and uh, we do not lose employment, right, and jobs. So I think, and, and that will affect everyone. So I think for, for the short run, it will be very important. Second, I would say take advantage of the access to digitalization, 
I mean, we know that everyone has been confined in, in, in families, businesses, everyone has been at home. And suddenly in many places, even in rural areas, everyone had to digitalize with the highest speed that was never done. So we have moved almost five years in, digi in digitalization. That means that now many, impor many more people has, for example, access to digital finance or to sell their products digitally. And that will benefit, for example, governments because they might have uh, more information about the taxpayers and business can reduce informality as well. Um, even um, public finance might be, might be improved. They might show more accountability. They might need to show more accountability. And also, for example, um, in many safety net programs, usually uh, food, uh, um, families were receiving food, right? Like, um, I mean, for their, for their, when, when they are, they, they were quite poor. Now it's much more often that many of the organizations that are providing safety net, they provide car vouchers, electronic car vouchers, and people can spend their money the way they want. That actually has been studied that it, it brings more benefit to the poor people. And also we can study what it, what is the consumer spending. So for those ones who are more vulnerable, if they have access to digitalization, we can analyze much better how they spend their money and how we can help the more uh, vulnerable people. And finally, I would say the third one would say partnerships. The SDG number 17, right? I mean, um, there is a huge switch. For example, the, the European Commission has a development uh, unit and is the biggest mm, development aid uh, office together with USAID, with the USA uh, aid office. Now it's not called anymore development aid unit. It's called the partnership unit. Why? Because as my colleague was saying, governments or international organizations cannot make a big push spending money and that's it, a big expenditure. Everything should be do done in partnership together, the private sector, the public sector, the academia. So projects, uh, policy projects must be done in conjunction between different partners. Otherwise, we cannot achieve this agenda. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, uh, so many important points there. Uh, but I want to pick up on your last last point of partnership and resources, money. Um, the OECD estimates that uh, developing countries are falling about 1.7 US dollars, trillion dollars short of what they need to, to um, be on track for the SDG goals this year. <laughs> but on the other hand, the IMF and some others estimate that it will cost just 2 to 3% of global GDP every year to fund the uh, SDGs, uh, which means on paper, at least they're affordable, but it, it seems that governments are so fiscally stretched right now. I mean, it, it is quite a big ask to sort of ask them to pony up this kind of, this kind of money. Uh, so I, I'm wondering, uh, maybe you should go to Lord Barker on this since you've been in government and you know how it works and all that. Uh, how do you uh, how do you get get to raise the, the resources that are needed? Would you would you raise taxes? Would you um, cut fossil fuel subsidies? Would you end tax avoidance? What would you do? Where will the money come from? As as a government leader, what would what would where, where would you what ideas would you have for this? Well, this is a very relevant um, line of questioning for the UK because I, this week they're due to there's a rebellion in the UK Parliament over the proposal by or it's not a proposal they've actually gone ahead and done it but by the uh, the government there to cut development spending David Cameron whose uh, government I served in um, became the first of the major economies to commit to and deliver on 0.7 percent of GDP um, going uh, each year in uh, development assistance and um, as a result of COVID, um, the current government has pushed that back to 0.5. Now, amongst the the um, larger economies, that's still a, a relative high number because, unfortunately, very very few have actually lived up to the um, the goal that, uh, of uh, 0.7. Um, and it was supposed to be a temporary measure while the British government deals with the huge debts that they've run up as a result of COVID. But what I think has been so terrific has been the cross-party rebellion uh, uh, that has actually sprung up 
to say, no, this is not acceptable. Yes, we've got our own problems, of course. Um, we've got real issues with public finances, but we're not going to do that at the expense of this very, very important commitment. Mm -hmm. So never mind how you raise it. First of all, you have to stick by that 0.7. I very much hope that the um, members of parliament on both sides of the aisle in the British Parliament who are standing up and say we're not going to accept this will actually overturn it. And if they do, that will be quite an outcome because um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has a big, major big majority in parliament. And if that crumbles on... Uh, on the issue of uh, development assistance and sticking by the 0.7 uh, objective, that will be a fantastic message, I think. Um, and then how do you raise it? Well, there's never an easy easy answer to um, raise, raise taxation, and it will depend on each country. Um, so I think you know, there's, there are no easy answers, but certainly I think we need to look um, at... Uh, putting a price on carbon. My particular focus is uh, climate change. And it is ridiculous that we don't yet price in the cost of carbon pollution into many goods and products mm -hmm. and services. And that's, that is something that's waiting to happen. And not only would that raise money that could potentially be deployed in support of the SDGs, but it would actually help tip the uh, economics towards a more low carbon economy. Now, I'm, an, I'm a low carbon optimist. I see the growth in the low carbon already, low carbon economy already. But growth in, and heading in the right direction isn't enough. That, that, that uh, direction, that growth has to be at the pace and scale that is commensurate with the Paris goals of keeping global warming below one and a half degrees, ideally. And if we're to do that, we've got to really up our game further. You know, it's not just to do it enough to do it on a best efforts basis or this is what we can do for now or we're heading in the right direction. We've really got to have science based targets that business and governments are absolutely committed to and bringing in um, carbon related taxes in order to, not just to raise revenue, but also to change behavior and change the dynamics economies. I think would be a step in the right direction. Yeah, very good. I think we're we're sort of running we're running out of time, but I'd, I'd like to give the other panelists a sort of a shot at this one. How do we get there? How do we raise money for this? Any thoughts? Anybody? Well, I think what what Lord Lord Marcus says is absolutely right. I'm not a great believer in just increasing taxes across the board because I think that just hurts economics and hurts businesses. Because if you don't plan it carefully and you don't target it, it will hurt your own economy. And history has shown higher taxes doesn't mean higher revenue. People just find ways of keeping money somewhere else. Um, I think the solution is, as Lord Barker said, is, is, is carbon taxes. I mean, I think finding, finding products, the carbon-based uh, uh, businesses, and making them pay for it. Uh, and that's where the money will come from. Uh, there, you know, rather than taxing the, 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 the rich, for example, uh, across the board, tax them on what they like. You know, tax them on the alcohol, tax them on, the, on their cigars, tax them on, on their consumption. I think a more consumption-based tax... Uh, uh, is it will be more effective. Firstly, if it, if it works and slows people down, you, you reduce consumption, which is, I think, one of the things the world needs. Uh, and the other thing is to focus on, on, on these, these key areas uh, that produce uh, the carbon emissions we're producing now. And I think from that, you get the income you need. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. I'd love to connect this on to Borja very quickly. Can I just say something? I think uh, taxation of consumption isn't good enough. It should actually be taxation of waste. And the more people are yeah. aware of their waste, because we want people to consume, and really rightly so to your point, you know, we need people to spend money. So uh, consumption is great, but the consumption of the right thing. The waste yeah. needs to be managed. And again, I am become, you know, I'm a believer of, uh, you know, money is not the only currency. I totally believe in knowledge, being power, giving people the knowledge is empowering people and I think that knowledge of a change of behavior will have a huge impact on a better world so That's a wonderful note, education note, wonderful note to end on but professor I think you, want, you, raised your, yes. you raised your hand you wanted to say something thank you Nadia no I mean in terms of finance I would highlight I mean I completely agree with